what gets me excited about music production is I've always loved this, the science of it. I love the technical side of it. So that's always it's like, like mixing stuff has always excited me. Coming up with an idea and, and seeing it through to the end and, and seeing that finished product is amazing. And you know, if you DJ as well, obviously getting to play that music out to, to, to people that are, in, you know, that are loving it, that's always an amazing feeling. That's really the end game is, you know, if you're a producer that DJs and you're playing kind of club music and producing club music, then that's, that's the end thing is playing that out to a packed dance floor is an amazing feeling. I also love working with other musicians and that's something which I think also really, really excites me now is, is blending live instruments with more programmed stuff, so recording drummers. I record my own percussion a lot of times, so I record my own shakers and wood blocks and things like that. and just listening to something and, and being able to associate a sound with a moment in time and then experience and maybe meeting up with a, a mate who's a musician and, and collaborating on something, that to me is, uh, is really exciting at the moment, especially is bringing, bringing, yeah, just having more of a kind of a collaborative ethos to it. I think like in a session when you're working with people and, and especially vocalists, that's almost like a, a, um, as much kind of psychology as it is anything to do with music. You have to keep like the positive vibe in the studio. So as soon as you let someone know that something's not quite going right or you're not getting what you want, then confidence goes. And once confidence is gone, then you, know, you just forget about it. It's all about the singer has to feel like, even if, you know, I've been in control rooms before where you know, you're trying to get a, a great take and the singer's not getting it. And you know, when you're off the mic, you, you know, you're saying to the, the guy you, you're working with, like you know, we might not be able to get this take, but you'd never let the singer hear that because once they hear you saying that, then, you know, they're never going to get it. So you have to make sure you keep, like, the positive kind of vibe going. And when you're collaborating with musicians, it's generally, a lot of the time, like when I'm working with Chris, we just roll the track and we don't necessarily have any kind of preconceived ideas of what we're going to do. It's more just roll the track, see what he comes up with, and then, then you work out from now, oh, that's kind of, maybe we need something more like that. Um, so it's just a back and forth, but a lot of time it's there's not really a time constraint particularly, it's more just fun meeting up, um, just jamming some ideas until something comes together. And sometimes, you know, if you, if you do it with, um, you know, uh, multiple musicians, it's even more fun because then you get the bouncing off of ideas and, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing and you capture that and then you can almost kind of remix the parts that you've recorded, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, it's great fun really. For me, the key fundamentals of, of good production, well, the first thing is, is, is great ideas. It doesn't matter how well produced and mixed it is, if it's not something which has got any, any kind of hook in it or, or interest for people, then you know, the other things aren't gonna kind of save it. You know? So I think the first thing is, is putting as much personality and originality into something as you can. So trying to find a way to produce music which is specific to you and maybe only you can produce, that's gonna set you aside. There's so much music being made, it's even more important now to be able to stand out in some way. So I think the first thing is to try and, you know, find ways of putting, putting your own personality and your own experiences into the music. That's the first thing. And um, for electronic music, I think the low end is always really, really important. If you can get that kick and bass right, so they're not, you know, they're not too dominant, then that means you'll get, you'll get a nice clarity to the other frequencies as well. Because if there's too much bass, too much low end, it really ripples upwards and affects all the other frequencies and takes away your headroom. So that's another thing which I think is really important to nail, is just getting that relationship between the kick and the bass right. And from then on, you know, you know, just setting things up, setting the depth of things to make sure you have kind of clarity in your mix and kind of depth of field to the music is really important as well. But it all stems from good ideas in the first place. My first break in industry was quite a long time ago now, um, when I used to produce breaks, musical breaks. So got signed to um, Botchit and Scarpa Records and another label called Finger Licking. So I put some stuff out on those labels and um, started DJing for now. I actually went from, a, I, I kind of finished university, I did biology and French at university and I was going to go and work in the pharmaceutical industry or do music production. So I kind of had a job offer and then a, a college prospectus to go and do a music production diploma. And I chose that and I started working in London in a hotel just doing room service like a complete job where I didn't have to think really, just went home. I did four days on four days, I locked myself away for four days just learning how to make music and it got to a point where the tracks started to come out and I was DJing you know in China on the weekend, five-star hotel and then 
the Tuesday I'd be back in the London Five Star Hotel delivering trays to rooms, which was just like mental. But then from then on, I was able to, to leave that and just go completely in music. Um, but that was probably, the, yeah, the first things when I started to get tracks signed to those labels. The biggest investment I put into the career, into my career, was actually, I'd say the same thing. So I graduated from university and um, I came down to London and I could have started to work at, you know, a kind of a bit more of a serious job, but I really wanted to have a go at music. So I decided just to do something very kind of menial so I could basically dedicate that time. And I watched a lot of my friends, you know, who'd gone into doing things that tied in with their degrees, earning more money, kind of going up the ladder and, and you're kind of there thinking, you know, is this going to work? But I knew I could always look myself in the mirror and say, no, you know, I can, I can do this. So I think that that was quite, you know, it felt like a gamble at the time to, to do that. And it was kind of, uh, yeah, but it was investing that time, just locking myself away, learning how everything worked uh, and just making loads and loads of music was, was definitely the, the biggest investment, was a time investment, I'd say. And I did actually buy a lot of synths at the time as well, but those have since gone. I'd say the time investment was the biggest thing. The track of my own I'm most proud of, well, there's probably two. There's one uh, called Breathe Slow um, by Figgy, and it's a Get To Know remix. And the second one is actually White Label Runaway Get To Know remix. So they're both remixes are actually the ones I'm most proud of. Because when I first set up this project, and I wanted to basically, I, I was kind of like, I wanted to combine kind of a, a little bit of an indie aesthetic, lots of guitars with like an 80s boogie post-disco kind of rhythm section. And I was doing some kind of experiments trying to see if it works. And those are the first two tracks that I kind of got it right. And, you know, they got a lot of Radio 1 play and uh, especially the Runaway remix. Um, I was really, really proud of that and still, and still am. So those are the two that I'm most proud of. My relationship with CR2 uh, started well, about five or six years ago. And actually there was an advert in, I believe, Future Music, or one of the music magazines. They were looking for someone to kind of work on the audio side of things. And I remember I met Mark from the label, and um, you know, we, we just got on well at a meeting down in Richmond in London. And he said, uh, what are you doing next week? And I said, oh, we're kind of, yeah, pretty free. And he said, can you come to LA? So then the next week I was in LA um, working on stuff. And then it kind of went on from there. We kind of set up sample tools by CR2 together to make the sample packs. And then I also work as the, the mixing and mastering engineer. So I, any tracks that need to be mastered that come into the label, I master for them. And we also do a kind of service for clients where they can send in their tracks and get them mastered as well. So that's how the relationship started. So I made the sample pack, the future disco pack for, um, for sample tools and, and the guys approached me to, to do a course on using some of the sounds in the pack to make a track and I thought, I thought it'd be a fun thing to do. I, I enjoyed talking about music production, talking about mixing, so I thought it'd be a cool thing to do. And also I liked the challenge. We decided to restrict it just to Logic uh, plugins, and I thought it would actually be really tough and really challenging because I'm in a different studio, you know, which is always always harder and not using the usual plugins I would work on, but I thought actually it would be really cool for people to see uh, something, someone working just with the stock plugins. And also from my point of view, anything which is which is challenging and scary is usually something which is worth doing because at the end of it you will have kind of developed your um, yeah just just grown a bit I suppose without saying too cheesy the idea of doing it just appealed so we you know people can see the sample pack and get to make music on camera. <laughs> We're going to be um, working on a track using a sample pack that I produced alongside Chris, who you're going to see later on. And basically we're going to take an original track, a get to know track from my project, and we're going to create a club ready remix. So we're going to take some elements from the pack and show you how you can blend them together to, to use for sounds in your tracks. And we're going to take some of the stems from the original track and blend them together and just build a track today, basically. Um, in doing that, I'm really going to go through and get into the kind of nitty gritty technical side of production and mixing and blending these sounds together. So we're going to learn about uh, compression, EQ, um, reverb, delay, um, modulation effects, 
We're going to go through the bus processing, applying some um, channel strip processing as well. We're going to be going through using the, the new logic and the stock plugins in there so you can learn how to mix using the plugins that are in your own DAW without having to you know, go out and buy a whole new suite of plugins. And we're going to take it right through to the end to mastering so you have a club ready track that you can send out to labels, um, etc. So what I'm going to try to do as much as possible is, is show you kind of overarching principles of production rather than just like check out this, this compressor on this sound, more like just overall wider, broader ideas of how you use these effects and why you use them and also tying into kind of the, 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 cues, the cues that your ear follows to be able to play sound. So you can use compression and EQ to, to kind of trick the, the ear into feeling that sounds are close to you or further away or, or wider or, or more mono and that all helps you create depth in your mix. So I'm going to try and as much as possible show you specific examples of wider concepts I suppose. Mm -hmm.